People don't like my sunglasses. Right, let's get her strapped on then. It battered the living daylights out of us. That's magic! McLarens are a nightmare because you've got to take rear diffuser off. Round the back arm. I don't use straps on a rear, I use chains. We don't want any slip, it's rear wheel drive. Okay, you've got launch control mode, but these three are the important ones. Touch of throttle slightly, bar 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 bar. And we're live. We are. Welcome to another episode of I Should Have Been a Strip Pole Greaser. <laughs> People don't like my sunglasses. Yeah. These are Tom Cruise Ray-Bans, mate. Mate. I know. Best film ever. Which one? Tom, to, yeah, Tom Cruise. <laughs> no, Top Gun. <laughs> yeah, that's why I wanted to be a fighter pilot when I was little. Mate. Up until I became a car mechanic. What, well, you're close. Uh, how the mighty have fallen. <laughs> yep. Snog Kelly McGillis. Yep. Yep. Do foreign relations. There's been quite a few um, fighter jets going over today. Fair, fair for this weekend, isn't it? It's the air show, so, isn't it? Riot. Riot. I know. I went, I used to park cars there with my mates, help park, like volunteer there, and it was really cool, but yeah. I couldn't be asked with all that stuff now. Um, this is Rocco 650S. It's not, it's Leo 650S, but I've got to say it's his kid's car. So this is the one we did all the engine work on, and it battered the living daylights out of us. Uh, because everybody and their dog had had a go at fixing it. So we did it properly. Uh, it's all back up and running. We put it through a load of heat cycles. Uh, it doesn't smoke now and purrs like a kitten. So we're gonna put it on a dyno, log it in stock form, and then apply some magic. Some special magic. REP sauce. That's magic! <laughs> now, only the older ones will get that. No, yeah, I know. She was fit and all, wasn't she? Debbie McGee? Yeah, that Debbie McGee. That was always the classic quote. Uh, when she was on the Mrs. Merton show with Carolina Hearn, bless her. What first, Debbie, attracted you to the millionaire Paul Daniels? <laughs> Let's fire up to girl and put her on dino. Cool, I went all dark side on that one, you, didn't you I? You went all Ryan. Read yeah. then. Lavlarino. What keys have I got there? Lambo keys. Right, let's get her strapped on then. Let's get some basing lines done. Base, how low can you go? So, particular way of strapping cars down. I guess it depends what <sighs> car it is. Yes, so some are very, very awkward and some are all right. So R8s are all right. Um, McLarens are a nightmare because you've got to take rear diffuser off. Yeah. It's already off. So we've got a flat floor off and a rear diffuser off. Yeah. Um, so you can get to the back. So on a two wheel drive car, it's not so, not so much not so critical, but the front straps on a rear, on a rear wheel drive car, sorry, on a four wheel drive car, the whole car is floating on rollers, yeah. two rollers. So the front, wheel, the front of the car can move side to side, so, which is why the straps are critically important on the front. On a two, on a two wheel drive car, whether that's front or rear, uh, again, less so on a rear, more on a front. A front wheel drive car can obviously move side to side because it's on a rollers, but on a rear wheel drive car, if you look, they're just sat on a floor. So they won't move. They won't move. So the car will pitch around the front axle. Yeah. Um, on, a, on a front wheel drive car, obviously the rear axle is, we would sit it on the dyno. Yeah. But the front, as it's driving, can move side to side. So, the front straps are there to keep the car on the rollers or keep it steady. Yep. And the back straps are to do the same, but also to stop the car driving into Jordan's Bay. Which would be a bad day. Which is why I don't use straps on the rear, I use chains. Right, chains. Okay. Chains can come true. Let's have a look underneath. Um, there we go. So we go. Round the back arm. Yeah. Get a little, make sure you don't clip a level sensor or anything like that. Yeah. So, like that. Yeah. Round the back arm, off the frame, wiring's out of the way. Yep. Good as gold, mate. Very good, and then very we good. just tension. Tension the straps, yep. put the roller in the right position. Yeah. Um, 
obviously the dyno moves. The dyno it? moves. I have a fancy one, dear boy. None of these shit make it up as you go along, dinos. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, so we'll strap it down. We'll put the rollers in position and the back axle. And then, and then, uh, I'll drive it in gear. Yep. To center the car, and then I'll retension it. And then we can. I've seen you counting these chain links before. Strap it all, yeah, try to keep it all balanced. Yep. So I try to set my chains up on the, between the outside of the strap and the, yep. and the inside of the tire. I don't like going beyond the wheel. Yeah. This one's gonna push it, but. Yeah. So this is a half and rail, so it's completely adjustable. Whereas you'll see some people have got just hooks drilled into the floor. Yeah. So that half and rail's dug in. It's got pins on the bottom of it and it's dug a foot deep. And then it's obviously sat in a concrete, reinforced concrete channel. Yeah. So that's so going nowhere. You ain't pulling this out, Mush. Yeah. Straps are no good, I've had straps break. I've had good straps break. I mean, that's scary, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, because you imagine strapping the back of a car down on a nylon fucking strap. Yeah. Don't do it, man. That's what chains are for. Yep. But I think we've had comments before, people saying that, you know, why, why don't you do a dyno day? And I think what you're seeing now is... Uh, I don't do dyno days because they turn into dick-waving competitions. Uh, because people's car will make shit power and it's my dyno's fault. Yep. Uh, I don't do dyno days uh, because it takes a lot of work to strap a dyno, a car onto a dyno. Yeah, well to do it properly. I see and it, yeah, you want to do it properly. Um, I just don't like dyno days, mate. I don't, do, you, do you know what I mean? People, yeah. people want to do them, but I'll put a car on there. It'll make like today they cars don't like hot weather they don't like dinos so it'll spit out a low number and then oh your dinos this your dinos so yeah i don't yeah i just don't and then the other side of it is the majority of sort of clubs or anything that would want to run a dino day is going to be pop and bang mat boys yeah and that's not what we will work on so yeah they've never really Floated my boat. No, nope, I get that. Um, I've covered quite a lot of dyno days for magazines over the years. Yeah, that's and it. And I've had I've had clubs ask, "Oh, will you do a dyno day?" And it, so it's 150 pound for a power assessment session with us. It normally yep. takes anywhere between one and two hours. Bearing in mind, I charge 125 pound an hour of that labour anyway. Yeah. And I've got 150,000 pound dyno sale. I'm too expensive apparently. So what can you do? Yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, it's never been popular. We've had, like I said, lots and lots of clubs ask, and then thinking that me giving them a free dino day is somehow building my business. Yeah. Um, so I right. don't, yeah, well, we haven't done them, mate, to be fair, I've never done them. And if I did a supercar one, we'd spend half a day putting diffusers on and off, mate. <laughs> Do you know what true. I mean? So it's like, So that's how we settle it on the rollers. So yep. line it up. And then afterwards, then we can make sure. Can't move this way slightly. Um, yeah, and then the other side of it is I don't work Saturdays. So everybody's only wanting to do a dino day on Saturday. And the boys don't work Saturdays. Yeah, yeah. So I'm gonna have to get them in to do it. I've never, I've never wanted my dino to be that kind of tool. Yeah. 
I treat my dyno like a 10 mil socket. It's there when I need it. Yeah. Um, rightly or wrongly, I suppose. Um, but I've never wanted to, this is going to sound really snobby, be in that position where I need the dyno doing all sorts. Like, well, I, don't, I won't run diesels. I don't run diesels. Because I don't, I don't tune diesels, so what's yeah. the point in... I don't know, it gets slagged no, off now. It makes sense. No, it's fine. Uh, right, so we've got the car sat on the, sat on the rollers, all sorted. Um, it's all strapped down, it's all secure. Yep. So now we're going to set up the dyno. Uh, so there's one setting I change on a DCT car which is this. So this is a speed where measurement begins. So of course we want to get into fourth or fifth gear as quick as we can, but some cars won't let you get there below 50 kilometers an hour, which is about 30 mile an hour. Yeah. Uh, so I open this number up to 120%. Yeah. So this sort of will let me get to 40 mile an hour before it starts measuring. Okay. Um, so we set that. Then we go into vehicle data. So it's a petrol. It's water-cooled turbos, it's got manual transmission, it's a DCT, but it works like a manual. Uh, we don't want any slip, it's rear-wheel drive. Uh, I'm gonna put it in 999 BHP mode because these get really upset if you have a slow ramp rate. So I'm gonna keep it on a high ramp rate. Uh, and I might even open the dyno up in a different setting as well if it still doesn't like it. Right. We hit accept. And so then we go to measure power, continuous measurement, the screen we just been through. So now we're going to rev match it. So I'm probably going to use uh, fifth gear. Yeah. Um, and match 4,000 RPM in the car in fifth gear to a dyno so it knows what the measurement is. So cool. let's do that. makes me nervous yeah that's yeah. loud as well it's loud it's yeah, you you're very cramped so i think it's just because my familiarity with r8s i know exactly how they feel after oh shit 17 years of working on them i know every hiccup every light every feeling i've dyno thousands of them yeah um and in those you sit low you sit in you can't see much rearwards um how they dynos really um, really aggressive in their feel. Yeah. So it's hard to get a feel on a pull for what's going on. I'm going to open up a dyno a little bit more, but it basically did in stock form, uh, 592 and 675 newton meters of torque. Uh, now you can see we would make more power if we didn't have that little wobble there. Yeah. Uh, now we had the wobble because intake air temps are climbing, which is why I want to open dyno up. This is the problem with Maccas on dynos. Um, so we obviously feed in it, feeding the side blades, but the charge coolers get a little bit unhappy, which is why when we do the big 720s, we change them and things like they like put CFS, CSF cores and stuff like that on them. Yeah. Because the charge coolers share coolant with other 
uh, other items uh, in the cooling circuit. So your charge temp starts to go through the roof and then it starts to pull power out, which is what's happened at the top there. So, I mean, where were we if we go to cursor? Um, I mean, naturally, we were nearly 600 there. So if you kind of follow on the curve, yep. you're probably talking 610-ish, 620 if we didn't have that dip, natural, natural over the top light. Sure. Uh, so what I'm probably going to do is probably going to open the dyno up and I might try it in fourth as well. But that's how it, that's how it, what it's like. I've logged it. I'll go for the log. The ECU is up here, dear boy. Aha. Uh -huh. Easy um, access. Easy access, isn't it? Um, so I'm going to pull ECU out because yep. you can't OBD flash these. So we will pull ECU out. Um, I'll bench read it. And we can apply some magic sauce. Uh, but I was flaffing around with the laptop because I've put it in dyno mode to run it. Um, so you have to tell the car it's on a dyno to allow the rear wheels to do what it wants compared to the front. Right, okay. Um, yeah, so. <sighs> yes, a lot, a lot to take into account. Yeah, I mean, things go biggity bang bang, gonna biggity bang. Right, need some boltings. Eights, bloody eights. Can you get on out? Can you see Dave La? Dave La now, is it? Dave La. It's fancy. Dave La, Dav La. Where did Dav La come from? Why Dav? That's such a Welsh thing. Because my mate Paul Smith back in the day started Paul. calling me Dav. Um, Dave, he was obviously a bit too long. Too much. Two syllables. I, cool. I became Dav. It should be D soon. Yeah. And you called me Dav La because Gav La, Gavin and Stacey. Yeah, yeah. And Americans who watch the channel, what the hell is a Davlar? Yeah, yeah. And if I called you what I call you when we answer the phone, we'd never answer the, uh, we'd, we'd get cancelled. We would be cancelled. Recordlings. What do you have in your hand there? Some harnessing. So we use CMD bootings to read ECU. Um, so I have to pin out LeQ. Um, and then we literally pin it out. Um, so we have to pin the ground, so you have to be very, very careful, but I've got a diagram there to do it. So I will crack on and then we can talk to it. Positive. I'm absolutely positive. 57, 56, 55, 54, 53, 52, 51, 50. And what else? Adavlar. 62 and 63. Yeah. So it's done, right, 13 is brown and 34. 42, 42, 40, 39, 38, 37, 36, 35, 34, 33, 32, no, 34. 13 is, do the way, double check, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Right, that is on. Put the power cable in the back of the unit. Hit, two seconds, see if it works, identify, let's over this chipset, let's see other chipset. So, this is the log out of uh, my diagnostic tool, which is exported as a CSV file, and then I put it in uh, i2 Pro, which is MoTeC. Um, so what you've got there um, is engine speed at the top. Yeah. Then you've got engine coolant temp. Uh, then you've got the ignition angle through the pole. Then you've got boost pressure on left and right bank. So red line 
and uh, blue line here, a boost pressure target. Uh, the purple and the yellow are actual boost pressure and then the green is intake manifold pressure. So you can see here look, where we are under boost, you can see that my intake manifold is in vacuum and I'm requesting pressure. Mm. Um, then the one below is my throttle pedal position and then the other two are the voltage positions of the two throttle blades. Uh, my fuel pressure target and my actual fuel rail pressure. So I make sure I get no fuel pressure dips. Yep. My intake manifold and my boost pressure temp. So the charge temp. So, I mean, what are they at the end of the pull? I'm going to shut the throttle. 45 degrees. Yep. Um, and then the bottom one then is my lambda value. So you can see here, look, even at stock, look, they run 0.75 lambda. So they like running they like being rich. Yeah. So what we can do now is we can go away, we can open the map up, which is what we'll do off camera, uh, build a file, um, and then obviously it goes in and then we can run the car and then I can compare it then what I'm getting to. So obviously what we're gonna do on a turbocharged car is add more boost, yep. uh, play with the timing and make sure our fueling comes in. So you could be fuel pressure limited. So as you're demanding more fuel because of the more air going in, you could be fuel pressure limited. You could be injector duty limited. So you've got to watch your fuel pressure, uh, watch your lambda to see if they start coming off target. Um, so that will give you indication if you are limited on those items. You could be knock limited. So as you add more combustion pressure because of increased boost and ignition, uh, then you change where you are in your knock window. So you could be knock limited. And then there's things you can do around that then to help your knock window. Um, like fueling, cam timing, that kind of thing. And then you start balancing between them, whether adding ignition or adding boost helps. So normally you would try to run ignition over boost, or I would, because if you're adding boost, you're adding heat. Yeah. So when you're compressing the air, you generate more heat, um, which the charge coolers have got to deal with um, and get take out of the air. And as you're putting more heat into the air that goes in the engine is less dense, there's less power. So you're always sort of juggling air density as well. Uh, and then, yeah, look at ignition. So what's not on there is cam timing. There's no point, it is tracking on value, but there's no point me showing you cam timing, but that's sort of straight away the kind of things we would be looking out out of the data log. Yeah. Um, and that's literally just a pull on what we did then. So um, I use i2 Pro because I've got it. Um, you, you know, an i2 Pro license is a, is a thousand pound, but there's other, there's free programs you can get out there called log scan and all these sort of things where you import your CSV file um, and um, to generate data graphs like this. Um, but with i2, I can generate maths. So uh, where it's things like long and short fuel trim adaptions, this is going for a pull, I can export that then and add it into a fuel table with a small amount of work. Um, whereas if you just go to one of these free programs and it your, sh your trims are doing this, you've got to go site by site. You've got to populate site by site. Yeah, because, yeah we can model it essentially and then just import it straight into the fuel table. So, Because that's how essentially how we do super bikes or how we do the R8s and the Lambos on the Dyno and Motec. So yeah, of course. We can pull it straight out. So, so yeah. is this um, ECU out for all McLarens? Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah, nothing's OBD pull. Right. So what I'll do now is seeing how long this takes to, there's no point us doing revision, revision, revision. Yeah. So what I'll probably do is get the file, get it on it, and I might just GoPro you the final bit. So add it on, because otherwise you're going to be sat here. This could take yeah. hours, yeah. hours and hours and hours. Um, yeah, but that's the process. Um, we, people sort of ring up and say, oh, I can have a stage one, stage two. So essentially in our world, uh, stage one is just a, just a remap. A stage two is a decap. So where you take the, the cats out and you do that. And then a stage three would be on say like a golf hour of custom turbo or something like that. So I don't normally work in the stage world. Um, you know, we try to keep cars uh, all law abiding that kind of thing. So we just try to increase performance. So I suppose you would say everything's a stage one file. What we drop on is 95% of the way there because like I said, we've done 
I've tuned hundreds of them. So we have a good starting file for say a V8 pre-face lift, have a good starting file for a Gen 2 or this and that. Uh, and then we would log it and go, oh, that's not right. Oh, that doesn't look good. Oh, I can have a bit more there. Um, and sort of play with it a couple of revisions. That's where, you know, normally we'd, we'd spend a good day mapping a car um, because it takes time as well. It's a lot faster doing it this way, but if I've got to load it through OBD, it can take 20, uh, to, so say an early V8, flashing both files onto an early V8 car, take an hour right? just to flash them on yeah. before we even start. Um, so yeah, in this instance now, I've got this out, I'll build the first file, load a revision on, put it in the car, and we'll see where we are. Um, what I won't show you is the revisions, revisions, revisions. So what you'll see now is when we finish this bit, yep. Dav will drop in a GoPro with another pull on a dyno and a dyno chart and me going, look how great I am! Um, which is why it's, part of it is you don't want to give away this keys to city. Of course. Um, hello. Hi. Um, and then the other part of it is, is uh, for what, bud? The city. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, and the other part of it is it's bloody boring. Yeah. So. All right, bud. All right. Say bye, Matthew. Goodbye. Matthew. Matthew. Yeah, yeah, I know you missed that, didn't you? <laughs> bye, Matthew. Bye, Matthew. Oh, clever one. Yeah, clever fucker. Um, right. Is that tea time? I think it is. Right, so I'll see you in a minute when yeah. Dad's not here. Yeah. Let's do it. Beep, beep, boop. Uh, so the modes we have on the car, so I've obviously got to use my diagnostic tool to put the car into, into dyno mode. And a lot of cars are like that. R8s aren't, uh, Lambos aren't, Ferraris are, uh, McLarens are, uh, Mercedes and BMWs are, you've got to put them in a dyno mode. They don't like the difference between front wheel, even, even slightly, they don't like it. So they freak out. So we put, we go into the diagnostics, into ESP. We put it in dyno mode, which lights the dash up like a Christmas tree. And then it tells you where to have your settings as well. Okay. So we obviously go to active mode on, Hang which, on, just... so I don't know whether people are familiar with a McLaren. So you've obviously got reverse gear. Hang on, hang on. There we go. Yep, sorry. So we've got reverse gear here, neutral drive. And then by pressing drive on and off, you can go manual auto. Uh, they're the window controls, that's front trunk, that's central lock-in, that's your handbrake. Uh, you've got winter mode, which like allows you to go second gear and stuff like that to pull away. You've got launch control mode, but these three are the important ones. So when you start or drive a McLaren, these don't work, they don't do anything. You've got to press the active button and then they light up. So we have to have handling in normal mode and we have to have powertrain in track mode then I want manual gears. I don't want it to change gear for me. So then with it active, I press manual, which puts it in manual mode. Aero, you can put your wing up and down as mm -hmm. you want. So I have the wing up so I can drag the air out of the back of the car and get the heat out. So that's how we set our paddles. And then you drive it like you drive a car. So my aim is to try to get it into fifth gear as fast as possible and as low RPM and low engine speed as possible. So we literally go, touch the throttle slightly, blah, 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 blah. And then if I just nailed the throttle with cold or slightly cold tires, I'd spin on a roller, isn't it, and it'd abort the run. So you've got to drive into it. You'll feel the engine RPM change as it picks the dyno up. Uh, and then you just lean into it. And you want to then try and get to 100% throttle as fast as you can. Because you want to take out any of your foot movement or anything like that. So you're trying to get to 100% throttle as fast as you can to measure the engine's max performance. Uh, get all the way up to the top, which is absolutely terrifying, and then hit neutral, or like the R8's both paddles, or Ferrari's is both paddles, to get it into neutral. So what's going on then, while it's going through the pull, and why wheel power is just hoo-ha, my dyno reads torque at the roller axle at the roller axle. So there's a torque measurement um, sensor at the roller of the axle, at the axle of the roller, yeah. not at the wheels, right? So this is why we put something into our dyno called inertia. So I tell it how much inertia is going on in the car based on the wheel size and stuff like that. So you have how much your turnover is, which is what your engine is, and then by the time it reaches the tires, you've got profit after tax. How are you liking that for business talk? I like that. Right? So how a Maha works is the engine produces power. It goes through the gearbox. Remember, your gearbox is a torque multiplier. So if I run a car in first, 
versus running it in fifth, I would get a different torque output because the gearbox multiplies the torque, yeah? So you've got to be careful with that. So we always try to run one-to-one, -one, the gear that is one-to-one. -one. Um, so it obviously comes out of the engine, through the transmission, through the, through the prop, through the diff, if you have them, through the drive shafts, through the wheel bearings and the friction from the discs, through the wheels, through the tires, to my roller, and then my roller to measure the torque. So that's that. And horsepower doesn't exist. So it's torque with a correction factor multiplied by RPM. So that's where power comes from. Power does, it's immeasurable. It's torque that's measured. That's why we always talk in talk. Talk in talk. Talk, talk in talk. talk in talk. Yeah. Um, then what happens is when I hit neutral and I'm in what's called the coast down phase, the dyno's then measuring at the axle of the roller how long it takes or the force acting upon the dyno in a retardation. In a re in retardation? In retard With it slowing bloody down. <laughs> Yes. Then what it does, so then it gives me a, a figure the other way. So for example, the car measured at the roller axle 498 horsepower after it's calculated with a coast down or P drag of 95 horsepower. So it's slower as in um, that's, what, that's what the cost is. So it adds the two numbers together. So if I get them tires hotter, if I do five or six runs, I might get that up to like, 110, 120, because there's more friction going on. So that would change the change number. Other dynos don't do it like that. They just spit out a wheel power figure or whatever. So just be careful what your dyno's telling you. I had a GT12 on a dyno yesterday and they are 600 and 590 horsepower stock. And he'd gone and spent 10 grand having manifolds and all sorts put on it. And it did 540 horsepower. But we don't know where it started. So a dyno is, a measurement device, that's all it is. So I don't really care what that spits out. All I wanna see is what my delta gain is now. What yeah. do I gain by the work I've done? So I tell people all the time, don't get wrapped up on, cause all that is, is a dick waving number. Yeah. I'll make it read a thousand horsepower. Easy. Cause all I'll do is just stamp on the brakes on a coast down. So what is it, 400, I can give you 500 brake horsepower coast down loss and a dyno say a thousand horsepower. Yeah. And we get people do that. This is why you see some tuning centers will blank out coast down numbers or some people will say, oh yeah, well, it's, you have to add 20% on all cars because it's measured at the rollers and it's 20%, as in your coast down loss is 20% of your power, which is absolute bullshit anyway, because 20% at 400 horsepower is not 20% at 1,000 horsepower. Because yeah. when you start sitting there and you go, right, okay, so at 1,000 horsepower, your gearbox is not losing you 200 brake horsepower. Because the energy in that gearbox for it to absorb that much power would make it a fucking fan heater. <laughs> so you've got to start thinking those sorts of things, yeah? So it's not a blanket 15 or 20% of coast down loss. It is a measured value. So in this instance, it is 10%. Yep. Yeah. On an R8, slightly more, 140, 140 horsepower. Remember, an R8 is four-wheel drive, so we've got an extra axle, extra tyres that are acting drag upon the engine. So it all comes out of much of a muchness, but... Dinos, bullshit machines. Uh. <laughs> no, dinos are very good. Operators are bullshit machines. Yes. So, yeah, I, that's why I don't post numbers. I don't post graphs. I don't do this. All The only people that need to know are clients in what they've paid for and what they've got because I don't race my dyno. Yeah. I race my bike. And you will find other shops who are very, very good at what they do, do the same thing. Um, yeah. And everybody is a dyno expert. So, yeah, we'll show you what we show you. And it makes what it makes. Yeah. That is as simple as that. I have promised no one nothing. It makes what it makes. And there's a whole host of reasons why it'll make different power take the slick out of, back, out of the back of my bike and go put a touring tire on it, it'll make more power. It's crazy. It doesn't make more power. It costs more on coast down, or it yeah. costs less, more on coast down. So your coast down is different. So that is that kind of thing. So just, yeah. At the end of the day, find yourself a good dyno operator or a good dyno, do your before and afters, and that's all you can do. Take into account your weather and stuff like that, you know you'll get people who'll come here and measure up in the middle of winter and a car will be cracking. And then you'll come here today where it is what? 
23 degrees in my cell and it'll feel a little bit fluffy and they're like, oh, it didn't do like what it did last time. Yeah. No, because atmosphere has a massive effect, yeah. mahoosive effect, yeah. which is why back in the two-stroke days, people would jet for the conditions day to day because it has a massive effect. Yeah, yeah. Right, I'm bored. I want tea. <laughs> Let's do it. Dino talk does actually send me to sleep. And there'll be people that are there that are way better at using a dyno than I am. At the end of the day, to someone building something at home, a stick from the bottom of the garden with lines on is a ruler. Yeah? You can use it to measure what you are measuring. It, but it is no good if you go, it's four and a half notches and hand it and tell me that number. I don't know what that is. Do you, yeah. you see what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. How many times have we gone to measure something at home and we've gone, Oh, yeah, it's a thumb and a knuckle. <laughs> and then you've gone to the other side. You've gone, all right, so it's about that. Do you, do you see what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. That's all it is. It's just a measurement for that instant, and it's only useful to you. If I hand you my thumb and go, right, go and measure up your patio with a... It's a thumb and a... Do you know what I mean? <laughs> it's that standardised yeah. level of testing or level of measurement. And a dyno is supposed to be a standardised level of measurement, but how you strap it, what tyres you use, what tyre pressure is, what the temperature is, how I drive the car in a dyno, how hot I get. There's so many variables yeah. that what comes out the other side is always open to interpretation, um, which is why hub dynos take away a level of variability, engine dynos take away another level of variability, yeah. and then you start getting to manufacturer level back like what I used to do with when you go and test it, like you go Tickford's, yeah. anything like that. It's climate control. And that is it. A little later. 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 Well, it is 3.44 on Friday and I never really got back on it. So the file's on there. Um, well, I've done a couple of runs, um, but I just haven't managed to capture what is going on. Um, let me see if I can flip this camera around a second. Uh, so the week went shit, basically. Um, Dav bleep that out. Uh, Tuesday morning, Mitch went home poorly and he hasn't been back all week. Obviously, Carl's down to a couple of days a week now. Uh, so it's been me and Matt doing three people's work between two of us. So yeah, it's been brutal. Um, and I just haven't got done anything that I should have got done. So if your car is here and I haven't answered you or I haven't finished it, then I'm very, very sorry. We are trying, but it's literally me and Matt. I came in at seven this morning to get, uh, well, I've done three jobs so far. I haven't sweated like this in a while. I mean, cake normally makes me work this hard. Um, so I've got three done today. Matty's got two done and it, it, they just keep piling up outside. So if I haven't answered you, then I'm really sorry. If I haven't emailed you back, I'm really sorry. And if I haven't finished your car, then I'm very, very sorry. Um, but we get for it. So there's no 650 update. We'll put it out next week. So sorry it's an anticlimax. Slag me off in the comments. Have a lovely weekend, because at the end of the day, all we've got is family and health. And I missed one, and I feel like I'm dying with the other. So phew, that sums up the week I've had. Uh, World Superbikes is on this weekend, so go and follow Top Rack because his turn one at Most is amazing, and then BSB is on as well. So um, Georgie Boys at Stock Thousand, so go and check him out as well. And that is it.